Okay, this is day three of our scheduling notes. Um, at this point, you should know what scheduling is. You should know what a priority list is and how to schedule based off of a priority list, okay, given X amount of processors. Uh, for warm up, let's practice what we've learned. Let's do this example with two processors, D1 and P2, given the priority list and using the graph right here on the right, okay, the diagram. Okay, so this would be a warm up. Okay, so again, let's start on the priority list, one we want to do first, which is G. So you look and see if G is ready. G is all the way over here. It has a lot of prerequisites, so we're going to skip it. We're going to look at F. Okay, is F ready? Well, no, F's not ready either. Okay, so we move on to A. Is A ready? Yes, A is ready. Okay, it's being pointed to from the start. I can go ahead and start with that. So let's go ahead and put A in processor 1 with a processing time of 2. Okay, we're good there. A is out. So remember, we go back to the beginning of the list and we see if anybody else is ready. G is still not ready. F still not ready. Let's look at C. C is ready because start is looking at it. And since it has no prerequisites, let's go ahead and put it as far left on the list as we can for our processors. Let's give it a P2. Let's see, 1, 2, 3, and 4. And now C's out. Okay? So, again, starting at the list, we look at G. Well, G is uh, not ready yet. S still not ready because it has E and B as a prerequisite. Uh, looking at H, though, H is ready because start is pointing at H. So since it's ready and it has no prerequisites, let's put it on our list. Uh, let's keep it as far left as possible. And how about give it to processor 1, so 4 H's in this case, because it has a processing time of 4. Okay? Now H is out. Um, so again, look at our list. G is not ready. F is not ready. Is B ready? Yes, it is. It's coming from the start. And again, it has no prerequisites. So let's give it to processor two. Far left as we can go. One, two, and three. So now B's out. Okay, again, start and look at G. No, G's not ready. Um, F's not ready because we haven't done E. Is D ready? Well, yeah, D's ready because we've done A. We've done its prerequisite. So as long as A is behind D on the list, we're good which it looks like it's going to be, so just go ahead and give it to P1, as far left as you can go. So I'm going to give it three. Alright, so D's out. Uh, again, G and F are not ready, so we move on to the last one, E. E is ready as long as it's above A, which it is going to be. So let's put it on processor 2, and it has six E's. One, two, three, four, five, and six. All right, so E's out. Now if we go back, well, G's not ready because F has to be complete. Well, in order for F to be complete, E and B have to be complete. So F has to be past E and B. So F is going to have to start somewhere beyond this point. And really, it doesn't matter if you give it to P1 or P2, just as long as it's past E. Um, I'll just go ahead and give it to P1. Why not? So F is going to have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Now F's out. And now we can finally look at our number one priority on the list because F is completed its prerequisites. And again, it doesn't matter who I give it to um, as long as it's past F. So I can give it to P1 or P2. I'll just give it to uh, P2 because it hasn't done anything in a while. So 1, two G's. And we're done. So it looks like that our project minimum time here, the minimum amount of time it took to complete that priority list was 19 hours. Okay. And remember that the spaces that you see right here, I'm okay with you leaving them as blank, but just remember that those mean that they were idle during that time. Okay. Okay, so the question that we're always trying to ask though when we do these problems is what is the minimum amount of time that we can complete all these tasks in? That's what we're looking for. Okay, sometimes it's easier to see than others, but 
the way that we go through with it and the questions that we ask and help is critical paths and critical path algorithm. Okay, so let's kind of look at an example to start this off. Um, you wreck your car. Okay, there are four repairs, there are two mechanics working on it. Okay, well, if you notice, the four tasks are given to you here, A, B, C, and D. Those are our tasks, our vertices. Okay, it tells you the exterior body work takes four hours, the engine repairs takes five, painting and exterior work takes seven hours, and transmission and repair takes three hours. And if you notice, there is one precedence relationship, and that's that the exterior body work must be completed before painting and exterior work can begin. So A has to be completed before C. Well, let's draw a project diagram to represent this situation. Okay. So from the start, with its processing time of zero, uh, we're going to go to all the ready tasks. And the only task that isn't ready is C. So we can go to A, B, and D. Here's A with its processing time of four. Here is B with its processing time of five. And here's D with its processing time of three. And remember that A has to point to C in order for it to begin. Okay, and then whenever all these tasks are completed, we are finished. We are at the end. Okay, with this processing time of zero. So there's the project diagram that represents this situation. And we've kind of done this example in previous slides. Well, let's recall that we determined that there was no way to schedule the project in less than 11 hours. Okay, There's no way to do this entire process in less than 11 hours because of this precedence relationship. Okay, Four hours to go to A plus seven hours to complete C and then I'll be completed. Okay, It doesn't matter that I can go to B in five hours and then go to the end or D in three hours and go to the end. It's all about that longest path that determines the minimum amount of time that it takes to complete the project. Okay, There's no way to finish all our tasks in less than 11 hours. Okay, This is leading into the idea of critical path and the critical path algorithm. So the longest path from start to end in this graph is 11 hours. Okay, This is called the critical path. Okay, Critical path is the longest path that it takes to get from start to end. Now, even though it's the longest, that is the minimum amount of time it takes to complete all my tasks. Because once that path is complete, all the other tasks have had enough time to be completed as well. And there's no way to complete it before the 11 hours. Okay, so if we can identify the critical path, we find our project minimum time. So let's read through what this box says right here. For a given vertex X of a project diagram, the critical path for X is the path from X to the end with the longest processing time. So each task, each vertex is going to have a critical path. Okay. Um, and we're going to identify each vertice's critical time in order to kind of go through with this process. Okay, the critical time is the amount of time it takes, the longest amount of time it takes to get from one vertex to the end. Using this information, we can identify the critical path and then the um, project minimum time. Okay, so as far as the notation goes, we talked about this right here. Um, that just means the processing time that it takes to complete a certain task. But in brackets, so not parentheses anymore, but in brackets, that number is going to represent the critical time, the longest amount of time it takes to go from that vertex to the end. Okay. And we're going to use that information again to find the critical path. Okay, so again, finding the critical path or uh, the critical time for each vertex is important for finding the project minimum time. Okay, the longest path to the end is the minimum amount of time we need to complete all the tasks. So if I'm looking at A's critical time here, okay, A's critical time. Well, the longest path that it takes to get from A to the end is to go to D and go to the end, which is a total time of six plus two hours. So it has a critical time of eight. Okay, in brackets, eight. Okay, if I look at B, 
Well, to go from B to the N is a total time of 5 hours plus 2 hours. Okay, so its critical time is 7 hours. All right, for C. C, the longest path that it takes to get to the N is just a single path here to E and to the N. Okay, so that's 7 plus 5. So C's critical time it is 12. All right. For D, well, D is pointing straight to the end, so its critical time is just the same as its processing time, too. Okay. And then lastly, E, well, E is pointing to the end as well, so its processing time is the same as its critical time as well. It takes five hours for it to reach the end, the longest path. So what we're going to be end up doing is using these critical times to find the critical path from the start. Okay, if I can find the critical time of start, then I find the project minimum time. Okay, so what's the longest path to get to the end? No, we only have three. Here's one, here's two, and here's three. Which one would give me the longest one? Well, how about through C? Okay, if I go seven hours, five hours into the end, that is a critical time of 12. That is the longest path that it's going to take to go from the start to the end. Okay, of the three paths that you can go with the start. So that means that the project minimum time, the minimum amount of time it takes to complete this entire task, is 12 hours. Okay? And that's really all we're doing. We, we found the critical times of all of them and determined that the biggest one was right there at C, so that means that's our critical path. Okay? So the critical path for this project is just the one that gave me a critical time of 12. So the critical path here would be from start to C, to E, and to N. If you think back to that mechanic example, the critical path was the one that gave me 11 hours. The critical path here is the one that gives me 12 hours. There's no way I complete, can complete all these tasks in less than 12 hours. Okay? So, it turns out the more precedence relationships that you have, the more difficult it may be to determine the critical time of a vertex or of a project. Okay? Doing this was this problem wasn't so bad, but once we add more precedence relationships, it can become a little bit confusing. That's where we come up with a little algorithm called the backflow algorithm that kind of helps us determine each vertices critical time. So let's talk about how the backflow algorithm can help us determine the critical times of each of our vertices. Okay? So in that last example, we started from the beginning and just found all of our um, critical times towards the end, and that was fine, but sometimes it's easier to start from the end of the project. Okay? You're going to determine the critical time for a vertex from the end to the beginning. This bolded part right here is very important, and I want you to kind of think about what it's saying. The critical time for a vertex, okay, what we've been finding, is the processing time for the vertex, okay, which is in parentheses, plus the largest critical time of any vertex coming from that vertex. Okay, This right here is a good visual representation of that. Let's look at it. So if I'm trying to determine the critical time of this vertex x with its processing time p, it says to add p to the largest critical time of the one that it's pointing to. Okay, so here we got these three different um, tasks that P is pointing to, and the one with the biggest critical time is the one that we add the processing time of X2, and then we have its critical time. L plus its processing time P gives us its critical time. Let's look at a more um, discrete problem here where it actually gives you numbers instead of letters. So say that we're trying to find the critical time for vertex C, okay, this vertex right here. But remember, a critical time is the longest path that it takes to get to the end. Well, if you look at all the vertices that it's pointing to, we already have all of their critical times here given in the bracket. Okay, so C is going to go down one of these three paths for the longest path. But which one is it is the one with the biggest critical time that it's pointing to, which is F with 7. So C's critical time is going to be its processing time 3 plus its critical time, of the, uh, the biggest critical time that it's pointing to, F. So in this case, it's going to be 10. 
Okay. And again, we're using all this information to find the critical path for project and result. So let's try an actual example with this. Okay, here's some application. Hopefully after we do this example, it all makes sense. All right, we're finding the critical time for each vertex, and then we're going to use that information to find the critical path. Okay, this is a very similar type problem as what you're going to see. Okay, we're, all, we're always trying to find the critical path for the project minimum time. Okay, we're going to do this problem using the backflow algorithm. So it says start from the end. Okay, let's start with the vertices that are pointing at the end. Their critical time is just going to be their processing time because that's how long it takes to get to the end. So 18 hours and 7 hours or minutes or whatever. Okay, so keep moving backwards. Well, here at vertex I, it's only pointing to one vertex. We already got its critical time of 18, so just do 13 plus 18, which is 31. Okay, moving back to J right here at the bottom. Uh, I'm sorry, not J. Um, H right here at the bottom. H is only po pointing at one thing, J. We already have its processing time or critical time of 7. So just do 4 plus 7 is 11. Okay? We're just going to keep moving backwards. Okay, if I move back to E right here. Okay, well that's only pointing to one thing, so we're just going to do 5 plus the critical time of the one it's pointing to. 5 plus 31 is 36. Move it over to F. Okay, well, F is looking at only one thing, pointing to only one thing, and we got its critical time of 31. Okay, so you're going to do 3 and 31 is 34. And there is critical time. Okay, so that means that from F, the longest amount of time that it takes to get to the end is 34 minutes or 34 hours, whatever the time is. Okay, for G, 2 plus 18 is 20. Okay. And here's where the backflow algorithm really is helpful. Let's look at, say, D. Okay. Well, D has two paths that it can take. Which one's the longest? Well, you're going to look at the two vertices and determine which of those two vertices has the biggest critical time, which in this case would be G with 20. So I'm going to add that 14 to 20, which would give you 34. Okay. If I'm looking at vertex C, I got to add that 11 to one of the other critical times, but I'm going to add it to the biggest of the two that it's pointing to. I'm going to add it to that 20 again, so that'll be 31. 11 and 20 make 31. The vertex B, it's pointing to two vertices. Again, which one is the biggest? Well, it's going to be E with 36. So that'll make this 39. Okay, so again, a, a recap of what these numbers mean is that the longest path that it takes to get from that vertex to the end, the longest amount of time it takes. So for A, it's only pointing to one thing. Okay, it's only pointing to that 36. So 2 and 36 make 38. Okay, and I've done all my vertices. So in order to figure out my project minimum time, look at the star and see which one that the star is pointing to that's the biggest. Okay, and that'll give you your critical path. In this case, it is 39. So the critical time for this entire thing is 39. That means that this entire list of tasks cannot be completed in under 39 hours. Okay, and the critical path is just the path that gives us that. So start, then we went to B, we went to E, I, K, and in. So start B B I K and in. Okay. Let's try another example. Okay. Follow along with this one as we go through it. Maybe try it on your own. But we're going to identify the critical time of each vertex and then we're going to find the critical path for the entire project. Just like we did previously. Using the backflow algorithm. Okay. Press pause if you need to keep up with me as I go. I'm going to do this one a little bit quicker. So I'm going to start by finding the critical times of the ones pointing at the end okay, using backflow. That's just going to be their processing times of 2, 3, and 6. 
Okay. For IC, it's only pointing towards FW, so we do 1 and 6 makes 7. Okay. Now, if you look at HU, okay, it's only pointing, well, it's pointing to three different things. To IC, to PD, to EU. So which of those is the biggest? Well, it's IC with 7, so HU is going to be 4 and 7, which makes 11. Okay. PU right here is only pointing to one thing, so I'm just going to do 3 and 2 make 5. Alright, but again, IP is pointing to two things. Okay, so using the backflow, the biggest one that's pointing to is 11. I'm going to do 4 and 11, which makes... 15. Okay, looking at PL, it's pointing to one thing, so that's going to be 4 and 7, which is 11. Okay, looking at ID, 5 plus the 5 here gives you 10. Alright, but here's IW again, you got to be careful, it's pointing to two separate things. Okay, so I'm going to add that 7 to the bigger of the two, which is 15. So 7 and 15 give you 22. Okay, IF is again pointing to two things. We'll add it to the bigger of the two. It's between 11 and 22. So you do 5 and 22, which is 27. All right, A is pointing to one thing. So that's 6 and 22 is 28. AD is pointing to one thing. So that's 8 and 10, which is 18. Uh, AP is pointing to one thing, so that's 7 and 27, which is 34. And lastly, AF is pointing to one thing, that's 5 and 27, which made 32. Okay, so we have the critical times of all of our vertices. Now, start, okay, if I want to know that critical time, which is my final answer, uh, it's just whichever one's the biggest, so it looks like 34. So the minimal amount of time that it takes to complete all the tasks on this list is 34 minutes or hours. Okay, no way to complete it before then. And the path that give us, gives us that is start AP IF IW IP uh, HV IC FW and N. And just to trace it on here for you, it goes boom, 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 uh, boom, boom, boom. Okay, the longest path on the graph. Uh, once that path is completed, everything else is completed and we're done. Okay? Okay, so let's combine this with what we did for warm-up, what we did in the last lesson. Okay, uh, because we've had, a, like, we talked about priority lists and assigning these to our processors, and we've been talking about how we could have so many different priority lists, and how it always could give you different numbers and different project minimum times and stuff like that. But we can use critical times and we can use critical paths in order to create the perfect priority list. Okay, that gives us always the project minimum time. And that's using the critical path algorithm, okay, which is what we're going to end with. So these last two examples we're going to do together are very similar to what you're going to see on the test. So step one is to find the critical time for each vertex. And step two is to list the vertices in order of decreasing critical times. And then step three is we're going to use that to schedule our project. Let's see what I mean once we do an example. Okay, so this example right here summarizes everything that we've done. Okay, it does everything that we've learned these past couple days with schedule. This is the type of problem that you're going to see. And if you notice, this is the same problem we just did for a warm up, but now we're going to create our own priority list. And in order to do that, we have to find the critical times of all of our vertices. So let's start using the ones that are pointing towards the end. So this would have a critical time of 2, a critical time of 4, and a critical time of 
three because they're all pointing at the end. Let's go back. X critical time is going to be five and two, which is seven. Okay. Uh, C's critical time is going to be four and two, which is six. All right. E's is going to be six and seven, which is thirteen. Right, if I look at A, it's pointing towards two things. The bigger of the two is 13, so A is 15. And B is going to be 3 and 7, which is 10. And I believe I've done them all. The biggest one that the start is pointing at is the 15. So my minimum time here, the smallest amount of time it takes for my processors to complete this entire list, is 15 hours or minutes or whatever the time it is. Okay. So again, I'll just transfer this knowledge over to the side here. Keep track of. 15, 6, 13, 2, 10, 3, 7, 4. Okay, so now when I go through the scheduling problem like I did for warm up, I'm using the priority list based off of the critical time. If I can create a priority list based on the critical time, it will ensure that my process is completed in 15 hours, the minimum amount of time it takes to complete all these lists. So, uh, critical path again is the path that gave me that 15. So that was start to A to E, F, G, and N. Now to create my priority list, that's just going to be putting my um, vertices in order from highest to lowest as far as critical times go. So looking at this list right here, that would be A first with 15, then it would be E with 13, uh, B with 10, then F, C, H, uh, D, and finally, G with two. So I'm going to use this priority list to schedule to two processors. Okay, so let's go through that process. Starting with A. Well, A is ready, and A has a processing time of two. So I'm going to put two A's at processor one. Okay. So now A is gone. Let's move on to E. Okay, well, I've done A, so E is ready to go with this processing time of 6. And just remember, it has to be past A because of its precedence relationship. So uh, let's just go ahead and keep it with P1 because it's got to be past A, and I'll leave those two little spots below A at P2 open. So I'll do 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So ease out. And if you notice, as we're going through this priority list, every single vertex I'm doing should always be ready. I go to B, and it's ready with the processing time of 3. No precedence. So let's give that to P2. 1, 2, 3. All right, moving on to F. F has, well, two precedence relations, E and B, which have both been completed. So I just got to make sure that F is past those values. So let's give it a P1, since that's as far left as I can possibly go, is right here. So I'm going to give uh, F its processing time of 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay. So that's out. Uh, C is ready from the start, so I can give C anywhere. I'm going to give it the P2 at the bottom, so I'll give four C's there. One, two, three, four, because that's its processing time. C's out. Uh, then H is ready as well, because it's coming from the start. No precedence, so as far left as I can go is P2. How about four H's there? One, two, three, four. So H is out. And then moving on to D, well, D has a processing time of 3, and its prereq is A, so as long as it's past A, we're good. And since A is all the way at the beginning, it doesn't matter who I give it to, P1 or P2. 
So I'm going to give it the P2 down right here. One, two, three. And then lastly is G. So with G, as long as F and C are completed, I can put G down. So uh, how about give it to P1? One, two. All right, there is all the tasks listed out. And if you notice, it ends at 15, which was our processing time, our, our critical time for this entire thing. So that number, 15, and the number that you got up here for your critical time, 15, those should always match. And it's the minimum amount of time it takes to complete every single task on this project. See how it's all coming together here. Okay, last example. Okay, last example before I'm done. And this is, again, exactly how you're going to see this on the test. It's going to be completely identical to this, except the graph is going to be different. I mean, it's going to be the same exact setup. Okay, so let's go through and schedule. The first thing is to identify all the critical times. Okay, I'm using the backflow algorithm. So starting with the ones that are pointing at the end, we get this one with nine, this one with eight. Moving backwards, E is going to be 4 and 8, which is 12. F is going to be 5 and 8, which is 13. Okay, but be careful when you go on to C. C is pointing to two things. Okay, C is pointing to the 12 and the 13. So you give it to the bigger of the two. 1 and 13 okay, is going to give you 14. Right. Uh, again, from B, it's pointing to two things, so you're going to add it to the bigger of the two, 13. So 3 and 13 make 16. For A, it's going to be 1 and 14 to make 15. And then when it's all said and done, the biggest one that start is pointing to is 16. Okay. So that means that, that if I had two processors and I was going through this entire task, that by the end, it's going to take a minimum of 16 hours or minutes to complete all of these tasks. Okay, so by whenever you fill out this schedule at the bottom here, it should not exceed 16. I know what that answer is going to be at the end. Let's go ahead and schedule. Okay, so again, all my critical times were 15, 14, 12, 8, 16, 9, 13, and there was no H. Okay? So the critical path, the one, the longest path that uh, gave me that time was from here to B, to F, to G, and to the end. That was the longest path. So that was start, um, B, F, G, and N. Okay, so let's go through the scheduling process. Let's create our priority list based off of the decreasing order of the critical times. The biggest one being B with 16. Okay, then A, then C, F, E, D, and G. So now I can create my priority list based off of that. Or, I'm sorry, my, uh, my schedule based off of that. Let's start off with B. B should be ready. These are always going to be ready as I go down the list. So B's ready with processing time of 3. So I'm going to go 1, 2, 3. So B's out. I'm going to go on to A. Okay, A has a processing time of 1 and it's ready to go. So I'm just going to give it to P2 at the bottom. Moving on to C, well... C is ready to go as well, okay, as long as A is complete, which it has been completed. So I'm going to put C down there with the processing of 1 past A. The farthest left I can go is at P2. So we're good there. All right, moving on to F. Okay, so F is ready to go as long as it's past C and B. It's pre -reps. Okay, as long as it's behind those two, or I'm sorry, ahead of those two. So, 
let's see here. On the bottom here, here's B, and here is C. As long as it's past or, uh, both of those, we're good to go. I'm just going to go ahead and give it to P1. Okay? So it's going to be processing time at 5. Okay, it's past B, it's past C, we're good to go. Okay, I could have put it down at P2 right here, but uh, eh, I'll just keep it with P1. Alright, so moving on to E. E has prereqs of C and D. Okay, C and D. So, I'm trying to keep it as far left as I possibly can go, as long as it's past C and D, which again would be at this point. So why not bring it all the way over here to the left to P2, okay, instead of putting it with P1, with a processing time of 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay, so now ease out. And remember, this space just means idle. I could have prevented idle time by uh, putting it up with P1, but then that would have made E go so much farther to the right, and that's not necessary. I'm trying to keep them as far left as I can go. All right, the next one on the list is D. D's prereq is only C, so really I can give it to P2 or P1. Let's keep it as far left as we go. How about right here? Processing time of not. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Hey, what do you know? Nine. Right there at 16. So hopefully I won't go past that or I've messed up. And then lastly, G's prereqs are E and F, so it's just going to be past E and F. So how about with P1? And it has a processing time of eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Boom. Perfect. It worked out great. That's how you'd schedule it with your processors, and it gives us the project minimum time of 16 hours. And that's how it's done. Okay, that's what you need to do. That's your work. Study that. Ask me questions. Y'all are awesome. Thank you for listening. Hopefully it made sense. Have a great day.